gentleman from Mississippi, the Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of you for being here. This is just, <clears throat> it's mind boggling when you think of where we are today and with the opportunities that we have and think back 10 years ago, uh, you know, I don't know that we could have envisioned we would be on the, um, uh, with such opportunities. And uh, the, the challenges really are opportunities for us. And so I, I, I want to thank you each. Uh, you bring uh, so much uh, expertise to the table to help us as we go forward to make sure that we uh, do things that do improve people's lives, that we do things that don't block that uh, cross-border flow. And uh, we want to make sure that we, uh, we get it right. Uh, and certainly uh, uh, there, there are those opportunities we're going to grasp and, and go forward. So. Uh, Ms. Espinel, you know, you mentioned in your testimony uh, that you indicated how digital trade can improve lives. I explain to me how that works when I go back to my home state of Mississippi. Uh, what should I tell them? So, so I think Mississippi, as we've already heard today, is, is a leader in healthcare and in personalized healthcare. And I think that's an area that's well worth emphasizing. Um, so I'm going to tell a story that is a little bit burn out, personal to me because it's borne out from my, my personal experience, um, actually in a couple of areas where artificial intelligence and the ability to assess data from around the world is making an impact. Um, uh, the first I'll start with is Alzheimer's. So my mother suffers from Alzheimer's. Um, it is uh, researchers in the United States and Japan and Europe are now working together using technology developed by IBM Watson to use the medical patterns of Alzheimer's patients from around the world to hopefully be able to find, if not a treatment to Alzheimer's, um, increased risk factors for Alzheimer's. And that is, that's an issue that's personal to my family. I know it's an issue that affects many families around the world. So everything, I think anything we can do to um, advance there is well worth it. And again, that is an area where it is, if you are, restricted to your ability to use data from a specific population set that is going to make it much, much slower to be able to see the kind of advances that we would like. Um, another example um, that is also uh, resonates with me because my own personal experience um, relates to Canada's uh, doctors in Canada. So um, doctors in Canada started uh, monitoring newborn babies, prematurely newborn babies, for signs of risk. And one of the things that they found is that right before a premature baby has, uh, has a crash, it goes into a, a serious risk incident, their vital signs stabilize, which is actually sort of intuitively very strange, right? So in fact, the medical practice up to that point had been if they saw the vital signs stabilize, they would uh, lessen the monitoring of that particular baby because the assumption was that the baby was going into recovery. What they actually found using cross-border data flows and data analytics was that, in fact, that is a risk factor for a baby going into crisis. And um, that has completely changed the treatment and the monitoring of premature babies that are in the NICU right. and has saved lives. Um, uh, you know, I, as a mother who, um, happily for me, very briefly had a child in the NICU, that is an example that, that resonates sure. with me. Um, very strongly, but it is another example of an advance that would have been literally impossible without the ability for doctors to be able to compare data sets from around the world. That's so uh, Mississippi um, is a leader in healthcare. There's, there are so many great examples there, um, and I think anything that we can do to try to keep the data um, within, uh, while re respecting privacy, to keep medical data flowing around the world to try to help researchers and doctors treat their patients is tremendous. Thank you very much. Mr. Reed, we discussed uh, a few moments before the, the hearing began, uh, you know, University of Mississippi Medical Center uh, selected uh, last week as the telehealth center of excellence. Uh, and that just didn't happen because they went around to, to pick that. Tell us how that information is uh, following up on that has helped. Well, ultimately, uh, the reality is for University of Mississippi Medical Center, and I think there's something important. Um, the ability to save lives is a critical aspect of this, but also let's not undervalue the fact that the University of Mississippi is also um, looking for the students that are coming out of there and the school itself to create jobs, to create opportunities, and to, to break 
to, to break the place that they are now and find something that they can do. They can hire 10 people, 20 people, 30 people. And you start to look at the fact that um, from UMMC, when they're looking to do spin-offs and those students are looking to build the next product that comes out of there, they're going to rely on data from all across the world to find that next solution. The example I gave you, if I've got to figure out what drug works better on this group of people versus this group of people, then I need the data to do so. And so it's important that we find a way to solve the health problems that we've raised. But let's not undervalue the fact that part of what we're also doing is looking to promote entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship comes from information. All of us are in the business case, we know that we talk about asymmetry, information asymmetry. We lose out when we have information asymmetry. The more information they have, the better the product they can make, the more jobs that they can build. And I think we should remember that part of this is using data to spur entrepreneurship as well as life-saving. Great. Thank you, Mr. Reed. My time's expired. Mr. Chairman? Well, thank you. The 